So I'm going to focus on um, the industry challenges um, that uh, we all face, uh, and particularly yourselves as, as professionals in the building and construction industry. This subject is, uh, of BIM is, 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 is very much uh, active and alive in terms of um, the, the approach that as a profession uh, that we're, uh, we're heading down. Uh, I'm not going to be focused uh, entirely on that subject. Um, and I'm sure, you know, oh no, BIM again, not BIM again. You know, it's, th th there have been many, many sessions, many, many lectures over the last couple of years um, um, on, on this subject. But what, um, what, what it really is about is, is about knowledge management uh, in, in our profession. And unfortunately, the term BIM uh, is, mis is often misconstrued, uh, and there's a lot of variations on, on what that term actually uh, means and refers to. And uh, I remember one of the sessions yesterday, um, uh, the, you know, the question was, was posed as to if, if, if we were to ask each and every one of you in this room what, to write down your definition of BIM was, I would almost guarantee that I would get 100% different answers. So there's a lot of confusion out there, there's a lot of misunderstanding. Um, and this diagram, which emanates from the, uh, the UK government construction strategy team, um, indicates their approach and their evolution and their demand that all government public projects by 2016 should be conducted to a level two BIM capability. Now, what does that really entail? Um, there's an element of information modeling, you know, the term BIM, building information modeling. I'll refer to it as just simply information modeling. And then, of course, we need to manage that information. So it's about information management. So we're talking through the design and construction phases here on projects. And from a client and owner-operator perspective, they need to think about how the asset of that building and the assets within it are maintained and managed throughout its life cycle in terms of operation. Now, from Bentley's perspective, we kind of struggle with that term BIM a little bit, particularly uh, the, the misunderstanding of the term modeling, for example, and the, the, the term building at the beginning. It's not just about buildings. Um, so from our point of view, and from, particularly from my point of view, it's about information modeling, whether that's a building, whether it's a road, where, whether it's rail, a transport, uh, transportation infrastructure, site uh, information modeling, land information modeling, and so on and so on. And if we think about any, any project, regardless, regardless of whether that's a building project or whether it's a, a wider infrastructure project, there are many, many, many sources of information that make up that project throughout its evolution from the initial conceptual uh, stages on the project to the ultimate uh, construction and commissioning of that particular uh, project. So this emphasizes the point, it's, a, it's all about information modeling. Um, and the other often misunderstood term that I, I hear frequently is the term modeling refers to three-dimensional modeling. Three-dimensional modeling, of course, is part of the process, but it's not limited to and should never be construed as limited to 3D modeling. Um, information, as this diagram illustrates, uh, it, it comes in many forms. So two-dimensional information, even paper information, plays a relevant uh, uh, role. And Robin Partington yesterday very clearly uh, explained uh, the relevance of the yellow tracing paper that ar an architect typically uses on any project. And even at the stage of where that building is now on site, it's about communication, it's about explaining uh, how to resolve specific issues and problems that have occurred uh, on site. Now, if we think back in time, um, you know, from the period of the 1800s up to, up to 1980, we're talking about physical infrastructure. Uh, it was all manual, even from a design 
uh, and construction uh, perspective. There was no technology or limited technology involved. And then when I first started in, uh, in the architectural industry at the beginning of the 1980s, that was the transition and that was very much a revolution in many ways, a transition from traditional manual methodologies of the drawing board into the introduction of CAD uh, for the first time uh, back in the beginning of the 1980s. And that, that continued through the next two decades. So where we are uh, in 2010, we're talking about intelligent infrastructure. And from my perspective, that's what BIM should be talking about. It's all about how we gather the information and make all of the information on the project available to anyone, any participant on that project in as an intelligent way as possible. So if we look at uh, a project, whether that's a building, a tall building or otherwise, um, the data or the information is developed and it evolves throughout that life cycle. From the early uh, design phases and throughout the design phase into the build phase and then the operational phase. And all of the other activities that go on, whether that's land management, water and sewerage systems, uh, um, transportation systems, energy systems, and so on. All of the information that's been gathered and evolved through that, that process uh, is relevant, and certainly relevant during the operations phase. And from an owner-operator's perspective, it's typical that that one project fits into the landscape of many other assets that individual organizations may own or operate. And we have to consider, or they certainly have to consider, how that information interacts with existing uh, information, uh, GIS information, uh, transportation infrastructure information, and so on. And in effect, they're building up a virtual world of their asset portfolio. So that virtual world becomes um, the many, you know, many, many sources of information modeling, you know, buildings, roads, rail infrastructure, utilities, and so on. And it, you know, from Bentley's perspective, it's about how do we correlate all of that information together and provide uh, access to that information, uh, re you know, depending on, on the requirements of, of an individual or a discipline or a profession. And perhaps one of the, the best illustrations of that full BIM process in action um, is highlighted and illustrated on a day-to-day -day basis as we speak by the Crossrail project. And from their point of view, uh, their objective was to create the data once, but of course reuse that information and that, that data many, many times. So the design information and the construction information effectively are, are the collation of the assets during those phases uh, and provides a fully integrated asset model for the purposes of facility management and day-to-day -day management and operation of that facility. So we're talking about integrated information. Um, and information, as I said earlier, comes from many, many different sources and will continue to come from many, many different sources. So it's a, a constant uh, compilation of that information and integrating it together. Now, if we were to ask and pose the question whether technology, people, or process is the most important aspect of that, you know, from our point of view as technology providers, maybe we would think about technology first, but actually, it's the process the process definition on how the, all of that information is gathered, how that information uh, is, is, is integrated, and how that information is disseminated, and how people interact with that information and access that information. So in the realms of big data, um, and, and essentially a project like Crossrail, uh, we're talking about massive data. Um, and it's not alone, you know, that is a massive project in itself, but even an individual building it's still big data. There's lots and lots of information uh, that, we need, that, that is available and we need to make widely available. 
So it's about, uh, from Crossrail's point of view, it's about bringing geospatial information, the BIM information from the building and infrastructure uh, side of things, and all of the assets that need to be maintained and operated all together into a single environment. And this, this short video demonstrates some aspects of the work that Crossrail undertook, um, what they call Crossrail Maps. Um, this is, in effect, giving access to individuals within the project through a GIS interface, access to any aspect of the project information. This is based on, on, on Bentley technology, but the, the actual manifestation of that is, is, is a Crossrail design. So at any point, um, a user can uh, click on a, 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 an outline on a map base and retrieve uh, information that relates specifically to that aspect of the project uh, and, and look at uh, individual um, drawings, documentation, or indeed uh, the three-dimensional model um, to derive uh, further information as part of that intelligent model. Now, as I alluded at the beginning, uh, there's a lot of misinformation uh, about BIM as a process. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, share a few myths uh, with you. Um, some of these that I experience on a regular basis when I talk to, uh, to our user base and beyond. I've referred to uh, you know, the, the BIM, or people refer to the BIM model. Or, you know, is there any such thing as a BIM model? BIM is a process. Um, so, yeah, models uh, exist, um, uh, but as I said, you know, in, the information exists in many, many, many forms. It's not just about a three-dimensional model. Should it be a single model? Um, and, and as the design team are working, uh, you know, is it, is it relevant or is it even logical that they are collaborating on a single model? Or well, from our perspective, that's not even feasible. Um, we have to think about the individual organizations that form part of the design team. Um, and you know, from our point of view, it's about a federated set of information that, of course, is referenced altogether. And we can access uh, uh, virtually, if you like, um, uh, the, 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 the model of the scheme uh, as if it were a single model, but it's actually made up of many, many parts. So it's not a single uh, database or a single model. Another myth that uh, you know, I, I hear uh, frustratingly on a regular basis that to enable um, uh, effective delivery in a BIM process, everybody needs to use the same software. Um, and that, that from, you know, certainly from our perspective, is, is, is very untrue. You know, and I think the nature of, of BIM as a process, it's about providing uh, interoperability capabilities. And, and certainly Paul Morell, uh, when he was uh, uh, heading the government construction strategy team, that was one of his key mantras. Um, interoperability is absolutely fundamental uh, for BIM uh, to be successful. And another uh, regular uh, uh, piece of confusion um, you know, from a client's perspective, and depending on how well informed a, a client uh, body is, um, that providing them with the design model and or the construction model, that's all they need. The design model in its, in its native form as, as, as evolved and, and developed by the design team that's only useful for them in terms of being able to make and affect changes. In terms of handing over to the client so they can reuse that information in an FM and facility management and uh, an operator context, it, it's about handover of the information, not the, not the design model or indeed the construction model. Now, some terminology um, that, that becomes very prevalent when we talk about BIM. Um, and this was alluded to yesterday by a couple of speakers. Um, we're evolving you know, plans of work that have existed for many, many years, uh, authored by the, uh, the relevant bodies, you know, whether it's the RRBA or whoever, uh, into a digital uh, form. You know, so the digital plan of work, as defined by uh, the Construction Industry Council, BS1192, that, that to me, in the UK certainly, is the underpinning uh, process um, in terms of how uh, information is 
managed in a working progress scenario, how that information is, is then published and shared with the wider community, and how it's ultimately handed over. Um, and BS 1192 underpins uh, the process here in the UK. What, we, what I see as BS 1192 is a, in many ways is a blueprint for other, uh, other countries uh, to follow. The fact that it's got a prefix of British standard doesn't suggest it's only relevant here in the UK. Um, and and, and as, as we, as a company, visit uh, other countries, France, Italy, or whatever, there's an immediate relevance uh, for uh, a defined structure uh, that BSL 1192 offers. And then, of course, we now have, uh, more recently this year, uh, PAS 1192-2, uh, which, which, which uh, refines uh, and provides further definition on how BS 1192 as a process can be implemented in a design and construction context. As we share information on a project, um, it's probably true to say the only open format for sharing um, uh, models in a BIM context is IFC. Um, so every single vendor that operates in the space should and indeed must support IFC. And then finally, in, in terms of handing over information uh, to, uh, to the owner operator, uh, COBE and COBE UK uh, is the definition um, uh, in, in which how information is structured in a form that's readily uh, consumable by uh, facility management uh, systems. So just touching back on to the, uh, the government's uh, BIM strategy, uh, you know, there, there is extensive documentation uh, available uh, now um, from, from uh, the, uh, the BIM task group that was set up at the, uh, at the starting point of their strategy a couple of years ago. And there are many, many resources available, both on the web and in document form. And this, this is the, uh, the front page of the, uh, uh, the Building Information Modeling, or the BIM task group, um, with a, a quote there from uh, the minister, Francis Maud. And th this, this, uh, this website offers uh, a, a, a lot of really useful information uh, that can act as a uh, as a guide to, to any uh, profession and organization embarking on their first BIM project. So the government's intention uh, at the beginning, uh, as, as a client, um, they wanted to, to be able to derive significant uh, improvements in cost, value, and carbon performance through the use of an open and shareable asset information. And I think that, that um, one statement kind of sums up uh, BIM uh, from my perspective. Now, from there, the, the, the strategy uh, was a combination of, of pull and push, um, a pull from, from, from the government's perspective uh, and push into the supply chain. And with their mandate of delivering level two BIM on all government projects by 2016. So their mission is to, um, for, for data exchange and capture uh, throughout the li asset life cycle, um, is about collection of data and that evolution of information as the project uh, progresses. But the key thing from their point of view is that information should only need to be entered once. And that information should be then maintained, evolved, adapted as required, but it should only be entered once. And it should become part of the day-to-day -day business process and not a separate step, which is historically what, what has happened. So they've defined uh, a series of uh, coordinated project stages uh, through the digital plan of work. Um, this diagram explains in more detail. I'm not going to go into, into detail on, on the diagram, but this information uh, is available on the, on the CIC uh, website. And it's about progressive data capture. So information is captured once, evolves, changed, adapts, but it's maintained uh, throughout uh, this progressive uh, data cycle through the, iterative, the normal iterative design process. So as I, as I alluded at the beginning, you know, there's still a lot of confusion uh, as I talk to uh, some of our users that are embarking perhaps on BIM for the first time. They're not quite sure. They're, they're a little bit lost, um, even perplexed as to where they should be heading. 
So my, my message to them is that there is lots of uh, advice and helpful information. And if I were to uh, cite one single source, the, you know, the, the BIM Task Force uh, website is a very, very important starting point. And the government themselves, the construction strategy team, will provide direction and any help uh, that you may need uh, to help your mission as you embark on that first project. And of course, push is very hard. So it's all about using the power of pull, and we need to encourage and educate uh, our team members uh, along routes. So the ultimate goal is about aligning our industry having everybody on the same page. And uh, let, let's try and remove that confusion and that, a lot of misinformation, mismessaging. Uh, the, the goal is to ultimately align uh, the industry on all the many facets that exist, of course, in our industry. So back to the, the diagram that uh, I showed at the very beginning. In terms of Bentley's approach to, uh, to this uh, and the BIM process as a whole, Information modeling, we have a, a, a whole array of dis, uh, uh, discipline-specific applications, whether that's ecosystem building designer from a building design point of view, whether it's our range of civil engineering applications in an infrastructure context. Information management, then project-wise, of course, becomes a really key vehicle. And um, project-wise, is not one single application from Bentley. It's a, it's a, it's a range of server-based server technologies. And the iModel uh, concept is central to that in terms of information sharing. And then finally, uh, in terms of asset, asset lifecycle uh, information management, our asset-wise uh, range of technologies, uh, an EB, XOR, depending on the context uh, of, the, of the asset, um, is, is fundamental in terms of taking information from the design and construction phases, that handover process, uh, which, which is a constant process, uh, into uh, building up the asset-wise uh, database. And of course, there may be needs um, in, in certain enterprises, and there certainly was a need in Crossrail to interface to other existing systems that were relevant for their business. Um, so other business systems that they had in place uh, and connecting project-wise and asset-wise to those uh, existing systems was really, really important. So ultimately, over time, and you know, I say very, very frequently, we're still very much at the beginning of this BIM journey. But over time, it will become clear and become second nature. And that's certainly our goal is to help our users uh, understand it from, from our perspective. And uh, I think in time, and certainly 2016 is not too ambitious a time scale. I think it's achievable. I think it's pragmatic. Um, we will get there and it will become second nature. So just my final, my, my final point, um, the, just to, to talk about iModel or information mobility. Information mobility uh, is about sharing information on the project. But as technology advancements are made, you know, the, the, the ability to uh, give access to uh, a, a building model and all the user needs is Adobe Acrobat Reader to view and interrogate that model or to view it on a tablet device like, like an I iPad or an Android device. That's where we're heading with our innovation uh, in terms of disseminating uh, and making that information mobile. Thank you. Thank you.